Greetings everyone. I greet your lands and your waterways from my mountain that you see, Hikurangi, uh, on the north, on the eastern side of the North Island of New Zealand. I have two mountains that I come from and I'm going to be talking about what it means to come from a mountain. What it means to feel that the mountain is part of you and that the mountain lives. I want to thank um, you for inviting me. And I'm a little bit jet lagged. I arrived yesterday afternoon and I said it's easier to lose an entire day than to lose half a day. So if I'm half a bit behind, um, it's because I'm half a day, half a day behind. I'm going to start with a poem. If some of you have been on YouTube, you might have um, seen this poem, but it's to set a scene. And I've called it Research Ethics and Indigenous Peoples 101. It began long before the Holocaust scientists experimented on Jews, gypsies, and others they hated before their industrial-scale genocide brought modernity down and Nuremberg set out a code. It began long before Tuskegee, the deliberate infecting of syphilis into black men's bodies to study their bad blood. Science voyeurs, watching their method at work, killing their participants one by one by one. It began long before the Havasupai had their DNA taken under one guise and then used against them under another, taking from the sick to feed the well, simply because they believed in their moral right to do so. It began long before the Portuguese had improved their instruments of navigation, enabling them to sail beyond their imaginations. It began before Columbus left Spain's harbours, before Cook set sail for Tahiti, before slave traders and missionaries crossed the Atlantic and Pacific, before the great synergy of capitalism, science, nation building and empire, <coughs> before the doctrine of discovery legitimated and fueled Europe's quest for eternity. It began long before the slaughter, enslavement, and genocide of native peoples, before their nations, their lands, their bodies, before their tattooed heads, their skins, their vaginas, penises, and wounds were smashed into millions of fragmented pieces, before they were disemboweled, disembodied, reduced to collectible artifacts exotic furnishings for the salons and sitting rooms of the wealthy. The process of dehumanizing, of not recognizing the human, of rendering others as beasts of burden, as less than human, as partial humans, as not quite humans, as soulless beings, as savage creatures. The process of conquering the other, of wielding them to the will of empires is deeply written in the history of Europe, of Rome and Greece, of Great Britain, of Versailles, of little fiefdoms and all conquering heroes we read in Europe's history of itself. The separation of flora and fauna, of humans from other beings, of humans from nature, of mind and body, of white and black, of civilized and savage, the positing of a soul, <coughs> heaven and hell, of human will, intelligence, morality, of emotions, of race, of gender, of the being of a human, of the rights of a human, of the natural order of things. These were the technologies that were present and were honed in the colonies, in the concentration camps, in the prisons, on the reserves, in the laboratories, in the institutions of knowledge. These are the tools we teach and promote that will inform and discipline, that will help 
and save, that will develop and advance the humans that these tools have dehumanised, the stories that these tools have silenced, the relationships that these tools have subverted, the environment that these tools have contaminated. It began in the foment of language and ideas, incited by power and opportunity, emboldened by a sense of godliness, institutionalised in church and state, practised on women, on children, on the poor, on other human beings, it was taken with the word and the sword across oceans and continents, across mountains and deserts and rivers. It was present in their gaze as they surveyed the lands of others. It was present in their bodies as they infected villages, cities and civilizations. It was present in their minds as they built their governments, missions and schools, as they made laws and regulations, as they built prisons and slums, laboratories and roads. Their values, their beliefs, their norms, their words, their feelings, their touch, their thoughts, their fears, their dreams, their fantasies. It began there in the essence of their humanity. here to talk about decolonizing methodologies 20 years on. It's a bit of a challenge because no one really wants to think of themselves as being 20 years older. <laughs> 20 years more experienced but possibly 20 years more cynical. So my talk today really is going to echo the way the book is structured. I want to um, I'll focus a little bit around knowledge and decolonizing knowledge and then secondly really address some of the um, ideas around what, it, what indigenous knowledge is about and what indigenous um, I guess ways of knowing not just knowledge might offer us and then if we've got time <coughs> um, I'm revising the book at the moment and I, I want to talk about some ideas that I've got for that, and I would welcome suggestions, uh, especially from those of you teaching and studying the book, uh, as what you would like to see less of, more of, or something new. But I want to start, really, with something that happened last week. I will, I've called it a sort of somewhat remarkable and yet underwhelming expression of regret that the British High, Commis High Commissioner recently gave to iwi, iwi are tribal groups, in Gisborne on the occasion of the 250 year commemoration of Captain James Cook's entry into the waters of Aotearoa, New Zealand. The ceremony was framed as a private affair although it extracted major media attention that was seen as fabulous, really positive, that the British High Commissioner was giving this expression of regret. However, the expression of regret came not from the Queen, with whom we signed our treaty, or the British government, but only from the Foreign Office. The iwi concerned were the ones whose ancestors had been murdered and shot and killed in that first encounter with Cook. The current iwi leaders were women, or are women, who were very gracious and saw the expression of regret as an opportunity to have their own stories about Cook's um, impact acknowledged and legitimated. They discussed the event very much in terms of this legitimation of their knowledge, of what we call ma tauranga, Māori, Māori knowledge, and their stories of the events that occurred. 
I provide this example really to illustrate the complex world of decolonizing a settler colonial society like New Zealand. I acknowledge that Aotearoa is viewed as a somewhat neat and tidy example of the indigenous context rather than the complexity of experiences across vast continents. <coughs> While scale and complexity provided a grander canvas for colonial operations, the circularity of ideas and learning and application of the technologies of colonization moved across contexts and that sense of having unique as well as shared experience <coughs> underpins the mobilization of indigenous peoples, um, especially after World War II. So Māori are one example of indigeneity and, and the experience of indigenous peoples. Language, in this case the English language, has been a powerful strategy of colonialism. It is the foremost of what Audre Lorde calls the master's tools, capable of destruction, ridicule and erasure of exercising intellectual and epistemological dominance and oppression and of framing and perpetuating discourses about colonization. Captain James Cook has been regarded <coughs> as, in New Zealand as a noble colonial navigator, discoverer, exemplifying the, the iconic hero of the doctrine of discovery who skillfully brought science, reason, and civilization to Māori people. The implication of this narrative was that, wow, we lucked out, didn't we? Because we got Cook and not Columbus. <laughs> His turning up in our waters is talked about constantly as an encounter. Like a chance meeting, he was just passing by. Whereas Australian Aborigines have long recognised it as an invasion. That narrative of Cook, the good captain, is embedded deeply in New Zealand's story of itself and in Britain's idea of itself in relation to New Zealand as a glorious, morally superior empire. However, Māori and other Pacific scholars have seen <coughs> Cook as the uninvited invader arriving with a scurvy riddled crew who landed and from day one started <coughs> murdering and plundering his way around New Zealand, naming almost every significant landmark of our lands after the most insignificant of British people, including themselves. <laughs> one of our scholar activists, T Ngata, sees Cook as simply arriving on a death ship and visiting murder on our people. She sees the commemoration this year as one that celebrates invasion. She argues that Cook's legacy is a 250 year war zone. Hawaiian scholar Hainani K. Trask earlier referred to Cook as a syphilitic tubercular racist. <laughs> Why does this language and its attendant ritual sensibilities, such as a vacuous expression of regret, matter? It matters because it is how colonial power works and endures. It matters because it establishes, empowers, entitles, justifies, and sustains the colonial imagination of reality that literally becomes part of the colonial real estate that links land and language, power and control, dominance and oppression. Cook did not bring science or Western knowledge to the Pacific. He brought a crew of rich bioprospectors co-funded by the Royal Society who felt entitled to steal what they saw and then rename everything after their own image. That is an example of what links science to colonialism. That is an example of how Western ideas about science and knowledge have been empowered by the doctrine of discovery. That is an example 
of why I think our understandings of knowledge in the academy need to be decolonised. I want to move now to a video. <coughs> this is um, the local Iwi radio station um, did a little skit to commemorate James Cook. All right, what I want to do now is to kind of turn to the topic of sort of knowledge and colonising and decolonising knowledge. And, I mean, it will be very clear to those of you who've read um, the book that I really stand on a platform of being a Māori, an Indigenous person, and in the context, working in the context of the rights of Indigenous peoples. So, for me, the decolonising agenda is one that, that I work on as being linked to the colonisation of Indigenous peoples. And I see um, a de decolonising itself as a process, it's not like an end point where you can imagine that we're going to be actually decolonised. Um, I think it is going to be an ongoing process. If it took the British government 250 years just to express regret, it's going to take like another 500 years for them to cough up compensation and give all the stuff back that they stole. So to me it's a process that works alongside our agenda, um, the agenda of Indigenous people, simply in becoming uh, becoming self-determining, becoming alive, um, and becoming the humans we saw ourselves as being before colonisation. And I see decolonising also as being very much related to context. Um, that it's not a simple or singular method for a simple or singular situation. And like, you know, other Indigenous Studies authors, I don't have this idea of decolonising as a kind of formula that's all-encompassing. Or a search for the simple and singular truth. Or as what Eve Tuck and Wang see as a metaphor that can be abstracted and disconnected from the actual material realities of Indigenous people's experiences. As Latin American scholar um, Walter Mignolo argues when talking about decoloniality, our role as scholars is to think about ideas and practices <coughs> as a search for the relational rather than a search for a global truth. So what I try to articulate in decolonizing methodologies was the way in which our understandings of science, knowledge, and research, and theory, the development of our disciplines of knowing and the disciplining of the knowers, as well as the methodologies or theories and methods for how we come to know and recognize the known, are so, so deeply implicated in the production of colonialism and of what colonised people will know, even of ourselves today. I see academic activism in this respect as a vital part of any political decolonisation agenda. And the critical role, as you know, of institution-based intellectuals has long been recognised by radical activists as problematic. Um, academics are often seen as part of the apparatus of dominance, and hegemony, or part of the means to gain legitimacy. So, as a scholar who works in an institution, I'm always kind of mindful that I have a particular role and responsibility to my communities and to speak for, for my communities in contexts where they're not present often, or if they are present, they're on the margins. I sort of jumped into the alphabet soup of all of that cook stuff just after I did my PhD. So 
So I wrote my PhD, and my one of my supervisors is here, uh, Professor Roger Dale. Um, I had two white men supervisors, because when I did my PhD, I think I was the only Māori woman doing a PhD in the entire field of education in New Zealand. Um, and that was my choice. Like, I could choose other white men. <laughs> <laughs> got a sociologist and a psychologist and they were fabulous so at that stage you know like 22 years ago I guess when I was doing um, doing my PhD I, I really jumped into it all as like a bit like an alphabet soup um, you know I started with the random letter R which was where I happened to be as a graduate student are for trying to do some research with my own people. And then I went to E for ethics. And then T for theory, that scared me. M for Marxist, that really terrified me. <laughs> and then M for methods, which bored me to death. <laughs> A for aims, which I didn't have. S for sociological, which I didn't understand. F for feminist, which I hoped would help me, but didn't. And then I landed on O. O for me. The other, that was me. And then on W for what the hell does this mean? It meant I had to start my learning all over again. And finding a different frame to think about and make better sense of what I was looking at, what I knew of myself, knew of my own history. So 20 years on, I have a bit more experience in the system of research, maybe not so concerned about specific methods. Well, the other thing I wanted to say about methods is, you know, methods books are probably the most boring books <laughs> that you could ever think about. Or, and you would never buy a methods book unless you were told you had to, to pass a course. Um, which is right why I wrote a book called Decolonising Boringness. <laughs> <laughs> and I did it deliberately because I was trying to speak through the book to Indigenous peoples like my own family, who I knew would not buy, ever buy a book on research. They hated researchers. They would never even look for a book on methods, unless it was about baking up something illegal. <laughs> <laughs> and they weren't really much interested in books that didn't have pictures. But what they did were interested in were the ideas that I knew I was talking about. I knew they were interested in that because they used to talk about it all the time. You know, for those of us who would go home from university, they'd go, ah, oh, universities, they're always researching on us. We're the most researched people in the world. Right, I heard that from my communities, then I went to Australia, and then I went to Aboriginal communities, and they said exactly the same thing. And they go, no, we're the most researched people in the world. <laughs> And then I went to Canada, and they said the same thing. <laughs> and then I went to the United States, same thing. Then I went to Norway, to the Sami. This perception of being researched on. And to have thousands and thousands of people believe that research was something that was done on, upon, to a people. And that it was possible to be the most researched in the world. I mean, I found that an interesting idea. And so I knew, in, in thinking through the ideas of research, that my own people would ultimately be interested. But I also knew they wouldn't buy the book. <laughs> so that's why I aimed it at universities. It's <laughs> <laughs> true. It's true, because, you know, books are their business. So, I talk in the book about colonial education, and I had done quite a bit of research with the native school system in New Zealand. And I think what I started on was this journey of connecting 
trying to kind of connect all the different sort of um, impulses of colonialism, practices of colonialism, to our actual experiences um, as Māori people in the first instance in our lives, in our schooling experiences, but also in our social lives. And there's one thing about um, colonial colonialism and policy in the colonial eras is colonial officials were very explicit about what they meant, what they intended. Um, they were so certain of being right that they wrote it all down. Right? If they wanted to destroy a people, they wrote down that was their intentions. If they wanted to assimilate a culture, that was written down. If they wanted to move people from their lands and take their lands, they wrote all of it down. So it kind of shows you how powerful literacy is when you go back and look at all these um, documents. So while these policies and practices were aimed really at our primary and secondary <coughs> school um, education, they were really delivered through very powerful mechanisms. For in, in Canada, it was the residential school system. And in the United States, they had a residential school system. In Australia, they had mission schools. And in New Zealand, we had a combination of missionary and native day schools. These policies and practices were unashamedly racialized, gendered and classed, and touched with the influence of various <coughs> church denominations and ex-militia. So there are a lot of ex-soldiers in New Zealand who became teachers. I don't know how they became teachers. And some of them should never have become anything. They should have just gone home. Um, but they were paid off by the government uh, with land that they confiscated from our people and with jobs uh, where they were able to continue, as Tina said, to wage war on us through the medium of schooling. However, by the early 20th century, they were propped up, these policies and practices were propped up by what was seen as legitimate knowledge in the forms of scientific racism and eugenics, settler histories and literatures, settler narratives of nationhood and citizenship, settler capitalism and views of economic <coughs> development that saw our lands and resources available for them to take as needed and a continuing destruction of our language, knowledge, and culture. Those disciplines that were interested in researching on Māori were in the business of mapping our demise while saving what they deemed to be the best of what we might have had. Their focus was paternalistic and pathological. Their interventions made things worse by entrenching these ideologies into systems. And their ready answer when things did not work was to blame the victim. All the time, indigenous people were meant to be grateful for their good intentions and to blame ourselves for their failures. If imperialism and colonialism forms the foundations of colonizing knowledge, then these late 19th century and early 20th century research endeavors form the steel scaffolding of colonizing theories and methods. I would like to think that these ideas have disappeared, but their ghostly discursive threads and vocabularies are deeply embedded in popular discourse and the anxieties of white extremists and more concerning in the default settings of those still in power. Disciplines of knowledge sound like an organized kind of idea. However, decolonizing a discipline is extremely difficult. Even when the old white men who dominate disciplines have died and gone to the library in the sky, <laughs> their names, ideas, and influence continues like a genealogical line that goes on and on and on. A simple decolonizing approach to a discipline 
is to ask the people who teach it if they are prepared to change its name, change the demographic of its teaching staff, and completely rewrite their courses from a decolonizing perspective. The first five seconds after answering that question will give a strong indication of the challenge. A number of reactions are predictable. Aspects of white fragility will emerge. It will have strong gender dimensions to it. If there are indigenous staff and students in the discipline already, and there will be to have reached this point, then aspects of indigenous ambivalence and double consciousness will emerge with conflicting loyalties and a defense of the value to the colonized of the colonizing subject matter. Pompous and paternalistic examples of rage might sneak out from the artifice of reason. Colonial racist motifs and stereotypes will be expressed. There will be forced smiles, a recourse to academic bureaucratic processes, and attempts to divert and reframe the suggestions. Other competing agendas will emerge. There will be a default to liberal democratic ideas about freedom of speech and taking a vote as if those who have power have suddenly been rendered powerless victims. <coughs> One further aspect that will emerge in trying to decolonize the discipline is the tune of, that's not us, that's more them over there, they need to change. People hide in their sub-disciplines or focus areas. Everyone gets defensive and some get downright aggressive. Sociology is no different. Attempts to indigenize sociology or to appoint scholars of colour or scholars who are indigenous in my context are met with excuses such as their research doesn't fit. We need someone with more internationally relevant research. Their theory is not strong. Their research is too community focused. And the killer, they are not really sociologists. <laughs> <laughs> we then expect them to teach the entire curriculum designed by others, <coughs> as well as provide small insights into Māori perspectives. Generally speaking, they are too much of this and not enough of that. There are still examples where the white outsider is the preferred candidate. Their scholarship seen as somehow more interesting. And their relationships or absence of relationships with indigenous communities seen as an easy problem to fix. There may even be a concern expressed about the working conditions of the cleaning woman in other words, the suggestion will have political, organisational, emotional, intellectual, cultural, material, individual and collective effects that will surface simultaneously. And that really is the dynamic that a decolonising approach has to understand and address. Of course, what I'm talking about is what people say rather than what the discipline says. But that is also the point. There's no disciplined goddess or god who speaks. The discipline does not exist as a singularity. It is an imagination with powerful sets of ideas, core historical texts, distinctive language theories and methods. They're dedicated programs of research and ways in which graduate students are socialised and trained to continue the work. Individuals and groups act as border, border patrols, governing knowledge in the form of curriculum or PhD dissertations and peer reviews. There are journals. There is an apparatus that supports the idea that it is a discipline and serves to resist challenge and change. Part of that apparatus is the university as an idea. But the university as an institution in neoliberal contexts is completely unreliable. So part of the apparatus is also this threat of absence of what disappears if these ideas and methods can no longer thrive. It makes even more sense that individuals are locked 
into the key conversations and our participants in dialogues, arguments and conferences. To be locked out is to not belong. Small pockets of radical work may form, but they spend almost their entire careers having to prove they are good, when in fact they are exceptional. How does this impact on sociology? Well, sociology is not exceptional as a discipline, except that the British Prime Minister, Thatcher, did try to kill it off. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of failed. I happened to have um, done some research leave in the UK during that time, and I visited former New Zealand colleagues who were sociologists in New Zealand, but when they came to the UK, they, re they were referred to as public policy specialists or ex experts in educational <coughs> leadership, and they'd all dropped the term sociology. But did they stop writing or thinking? No. Sociological ideas continue to thrive, reforming in the face of threat, finding different spaces to take hold, and still maintaining itself as sociology. I have colleagues who are calling for an indigenous sociology stream at sociology conferences in Australia and New Zealand, <coughs> and for the teaching of an indigenous sociology in degree programs. Indigenous social work qualifications would make sense in New Zealand, where most of the clients of social work are Māori. No, soci no sociology in New Zealand, no, I've got this wrong, no, sociology in New Zealand <laughs> has not been decolonised, even with amazing academic Māori sociologists working in our institutions. So am I saying that it is impossible to decolonise disciplines and knowledge? No, not at all. What decolonising methodologies and other scholarship in this area say is that there is a limit to the utility of the master's tools. These tools are ultimately too familiar, too predictable, too implicated in building the master's house and other tools are needed to dismantle it. This is where we need to think about completely different understandings of knowledge, of what it means to know and to be. It is where accepting that there are different conceptions of knowledge is a are a possibility. So while knowledge can travel across borders, it is nurtured and nourished in specialist places like universities. Decolonising universities is an important project, beginning with the dismantling of the forms and symbols of homage to colonial figures who are responsible for the death and destruction of millions of people. <coughs> In Canada, this effort is framed as a reconciliation project with an emphasis on indigenisation. In New Zealand, this has always been framed as a bicultural project using the Treaty of Waitangi as a sort of partnership model. I don't know what it might mean in the UK and other European contexts, but it would need to be framed differently. It, if it took 250 years for the British High Commissioner to express regret, well, it might take another 250 years to say sorry and to offer compensation and beg for forgiveness. They will continue, the people there will continue to wait for their full apology from the Crown. I've spent my entire academic career in universities trying to transform what the university could be for Māori. I did argue in the book, and I still argue, that one of those important tasks we do in institu institutions is actually to write to write, write, write. It's what I tell my students. That's why I urge them to complete their qualifications and to carry on writing. Because we have to write ourselves into institutions. And just when you think, my God, it's changing, we get new people. And it goes right back to where it was. <laughs> so 
It's not the most satisfying career if what you want to get out of decolonising a university is this clean factory after 25 years of a career or 30 years. What you get is a sense of change. What you get is the investment in a generation that you hope will continue the work. In my work, I'll, I want now to turn to Indigenous knowledge. I do, don't really see myself as an Indigenous knowledge expert. But what I do see is that my identity, my being, um, my existence has been informed by what I took for granted as Indigenous knowledge. And it seems to me that the work of beginning to examine Indigenous knowledge or other excluded and forbidden knowledges is exactly the work sociology is made for. And to bring those into a decolonising agenda. I just don't think we can change a discipline or even a department necessarily from the inside. Um, that's not how I've lived my career or experienced it. Having said that, I know that I've influenced um, my field, but I look now at schools of education in New Zealand and they have just shriveled again. So while we may work to open spaces that we might call decolonising spaces, in, in the context of universities, particularly in New Zealand, those spaces open temporarily and are fragile. And then they close. And then they open again somewhere else. And then they close. So let me talk about Indigenous knowledge. Indigenous knowing and Indigenous being in the world. So, I want to move to a slide. Oh, before I move to the slide, <coughs> those are all my great-grandmothers. Um, this is a house that came back after 100 years of being stolen by the government and displayed at ex exhibitions all over the world. The museum um, in Otago wanted to keep it in a museum, and um, my tribe and leaders said no. It's meant to live. Our houses are meant to live, to be alive. And so we will stand it up again as a living house. And really, this, I think, is, I guess, how I want to think about how we look at the world <coughs> and how we position ourselves in the world. But I want to bring you to this slide. Now, if you didn't... So you know what those are, eh? You know what those are? Egg yeah, so if you didn't know <coughs> the shape of an egg, how would you put those back together again? So that's the image I want you to have of what it means for me and others to talk about our knowledge after colonialism. Yeah. that what we're embarked on is this huge project of trying to put it back together again. And, and I want you to think about this image in terms of the tools that one might need to rebuild an egg. If you were doing a jigsaw puzzle, you could go to the corners, eh? You could build the corners, and you could sort of then build the edges. But you can't do that with <coughs> egg shapes. Um, also, you could sort of try sorting it by colour. You know, but that doesn't necessarily give you the whole shape of an egg. So I want to tell you a story, and it's a story that concerns the British Museum. It has a sail in it. Uh, it's the last surviving sail 
of an ocean-going canoe that was constructed in traditional materials. And no, the British Museum is not wanting to give it back. But um, I visited with some colleagues. One was an astronomer, Māori astronomer. One was a Māori navigator. And one was a Māori weaver. Right, so three different specialties. They all had PhDs in these specialties. They came to the British Museum to examine the sail. The weaver saw <coughs> the weave of the sail. She was excited by the complexity of the weave, by the materials that were used in the weave, and how different it is, and how hard it would be to reconstruct. And she was curious about the fact that the sail had small holes in it, um, and that it had sort of flexibility in parts of the sail. And the navigator was standing there saying, well, if you've got a sail, you know, the sail needs to perform a sort of function in terms of wind, and this is why it would have been this shape, and this is why it would have had some holes here, because it, this was, it would have performed better as a sail. And so they were having this conversation about sail, some weaving, and then the astronomer said something like, I wonder which route the sail took across the Pacific, what its route was. So those are the kinds of tools that we have to reconstruct to re really even begin to put this back together again. It's not one body of knowledge because we've been all smashed up. It's in, it's in museums all around the world. And so, bit by bit, we've got to recover our own knowledge. We've got to be confident about what it is. And then we've got to talk to each other about what that means. And I think one of the things uh, about Māori that we've been doing over the, first th third, uh, the last 30 years is this huge revitalisation of the knowledge <coughs> project and revitalization of our language, revitalization of all these different specialties. Now we've had to do that in the face of experts saying things like, your, your language will never um, thrive because it's dying. Uh, teaching your language to early childhood, children and early childhood programs will not work. Um, there is no, why would you try and sail the ocean again using traditional methods when you can just hop on a plane? Why do you want to weave with traditional materials when you have all these other materials? So there's, in other words, a sort of constant sort of questioning of why we might want to do that. And I guess what I would want to say is, we, we want to do that because we need to do that. We need to do that because inside all of that is us, is who we are. And we need to not only find out who we are, we kind of, what I've been saying lately to our students is, we need to learn how to love who we are. how to love who we were. Because one of the impacts of colonization is you hate who you become. You don't like yourselves. And you don't like or value what you think you knew. And so a lot of this process is about falling in love with ourselves. Um, and if you come from a tribe other than my one, all the other tribes say, that's what my tribe are really good at, loving ourselves. <laughs> and we say, yes, we are. Because that's how we should be. So just to finish, because I'm skipping through lots of different place, things here. So I think one of the things I want to say about Indigenous knowledge is we're not the only ones doing this, obviously. There are lots of different uh, Indigenous contexts and people 
thinking about what are the sort of fundamental elements that many of these indigenous knowledge systems share. And one of the key ones is this idea of relationality, that we as humans are related to everything on Mother Earth. And in the Māori um, worldview, we are actually, we are related. We are related through genealogies. Our genealogies as humans are important, but our stories actually <coughs> show us that we're also related to every other living and non-living thing um, in our environment. That we share the same gods. We just came down different lines. Um, so just to kind of reinforce that, I'm not sure if you heard that um, recently in New Zealand, a river was given personhood, mm -hmm. legal status, if you like, as a river. And the tribe who argued for that had a very famous proverb or saying, which was, I am the river, the river is me. Or, the river is me, I am the river. And so as part of their treaty settlement, they argued that their river be given the status of personhood. Another tribe also argued for the national park that they're in to also be given legal personhood. So why is that important? It comes back to what I talked about at the beginning with my mountain. We live in relation to our environment. And just as I said, sociology wasn't that exceptional. I'll also say that human beings aren't that exceptional either. <laughs> um, that humans have responsibilities in the environment, but we are not exceptional. And what it means to live in a sort of knowledge paradigm where you are always responsible, ethically responsible for what happens in the environment. You have to then develop a range of strategies for sustaining that environment. So for many of our people, they will say, you have to restore the environment to restore our health and well-being. And I know 20 years ago, people would have thought, oh, that's a silly idea. But actually now, that our waterways are hugely polluted, that our lands are polluted, you know, pretty much everyone in New Zealand accepts that if you have a polluted environment, your body's not going to be actually able to thrive. So just one example of relationality is to think about the environment differently. But we take it further because we don't have that category of animate and inanimate uh, in Māori language, nor do many other, um, other indigenous peoples. So we see everything in the environment as having the potential to be animated. That, and that the role of our <coughs> specialists, our professors, if you like, they have the power to animate a stone. They have the power to animate um, something that we might say is not living. And that power can be temporary or it can be permanent. But that object then becomes something that we have to be responsible for. And I'll just give you a little example of how that might work ethically. So I'm part of a tribal university. I know my time is up. Um, and we had to design an ethics policy. And that's part of the deal in New Zealand with every institution. And we also had to design an ethics policy for animals. So we sat around thinking, OK, what is an animal? What's an animal? So you talk into a group of Māori. Remember in New Zealand, we don't have big, large native land mammals. All right, all, all those mammals were introduced. Most of our animals, we have birds, and our big mammal is a whale, the whales. So for us to sit around and asking what is an animal is not a, a ridiculous question, really. Um, 
Now we decided we'll look up what other institutions do because comping is a good form of <laughs> trying to do a job efficiently. <laughs> and then we thought, oh, they separate animals out into those animals that are seen as sentient, that might suffer pain. They don't talk about pleasure, just pain, if you harm them. I thought, oh, that's quite good, yeah, all right. <laughs> but what do we actually do? in our practices, what do we do? So what we do with any other thing in the environment, if you take something from the sea, if you take something from the forest, first thing you have to do is say what we call a karakia or a prayer. We have to seek permission. We have to promise to treat that object well, that thing. We can eat it. But we can't then turn around and throw um, our fish bones back out into the water because all the relatives of the fish will know what we've done. <laughs> right? And they'll be very upset with us. So we have to seek the permission from those in the environment for us to work with them. And then we have to be grateful. We have to express gratitude. So that was what we put in our ethics policy. That every student who does research with animals or with living entities or entities in the environment, their ethical code of conduct is they have to work out the protocols for working with that particular entity. And they have to show um, gratitude in their work for doing that. Gratitude <coughs> to that particular um, entity that they worked with, but to that entity's family as well. And does it prevent research? Does it become a barrier to research? No. It's just a different way of thinking about the objects or the subjects or the entities that we work with. And it forces a kind of slowness a sort of constant seeking of permission. It doesn't just, can I have your consent please sign here, and now I'll just carry on and change my methods. <laughs> so no, we all do that. Um, it's this constant seeking of permission and expression of gratitude. Um, not only gratitude in terms of I'm really grateful that that sea urchin allowed me to work with it and I liked eating it. But gratitude in the sense that I'm the kind of researcher who feels good about the work that I do because I know that the work that I do is based on caring and compassion for the entity that I work with. So I'm going to stop there, because I know my time is done, and hopefully there'll be time for questions. Thank you very much.